September 11th from 1 to 4 p.m., the film Dalai Lama Renaissance will screen at the Mount Diablo Unitarian Universalist Church Fellowship Hall at 55 Eckley Lane, Walnut Creek. The screening includes a discussion with the director. $20 admission, $10 for students, no one turned away. For details, call 925-933-7850. The community calendar is produced by members of the KPFA Apprenticeship Program. Send your listing at least three weeks in advance to KPFA Box 51 1929 Martin Luther King Jr. Way in Berkeley, California 94704. Fax them to 510-848-3812 or email us at calendar at kpfa.org. Attention to the community calendar. Tell us if your event is wheelchair accessible. To hear this calendar again, call 510-848-6767 extension 621. This calendar is also online at kpfa.org. You are listening to 94.1 KPFA in Berkeley, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, and online at kpfa.org. The time is 7.01. Up next, Full Circle. Full Circle, yes, we run the place. 360 degrees, high, high, 360 degrees, high, high, 306, 306, 360 degrees, high, high. Welcome to Full Circle, your cultural affairs radio magazine, produced by members of the KPFA Apprenticeship Program. On tonight's show, you will hear a Vox Pop from Shoppers at the Bay Street Mall, an excerpt from a documentary about the Emeryville Shell Mound, and a conversation with the director, Andre Citadel. Ariel Lucky's hip-hop theater piece on the Shell Mound, and do-it-yourself entrepreneurs with alternatives to corporate capitalism. Tonight on the mics, you have Jane and Sukari. Stay with us. Good evening. Remnants of the Emeryville Shell Mound now lie beneath the Bay Street Shopping Center. Hundreds of Ohlone Indian burials and the artifacts found with them during the construction of the shopping center have been reburied in the six feet of shell mound that was rediscovered during the building of the high-density shopping mall. The Old Navy store is planted firmly on top of what was once one of the largest and oldest shell mounds in the Bay Area. On the back side of the store, a memorial of the site has been created. Thousands of shoppers flock to the site with little or no knowledge of its history. Here are the voices of Bay Street sh- uh, shoppers as they learn about the history of the site. I think there are so many places in this country and around the world where, of course, there are new kinds of civilizations like this mall that have been erected on top of what was once sacred and what was maybe maybe what was also once a marketplace. Maybe the equivalent of Old Navy, whatever that might have been, you know, could have been in this very spot. You know, um, this is the land of the native Indians that should be respected. There should be some sort of um, win-win solutions to these things, you know, where both communities win. Uh, and there should be some accommodation of um, those sort of beliefs and principles. They would have built on a Native American place that was sacred to them. So it does upset me. I think they should have researched it and talked to people. It does affect me. Uh, One of the problems is that it's easy to think a Native American burial ground is sacred and a shopping mall is profane, right? But really, they're probably both a bit of each. I mean, there's a lot of things going on right now down this walkway that are beautiful and sacred. And I'm sure some terrible things happened on that ground back in that time as well. It's hard. You know, I mean, like now that you said that and told me that, I feel a little bad about being here, (laughs) you know, shopping. Uh, 
I like that it's an open-air shopping mall and that it's done with as much care as it has been done. And the beauty of the sculpture and the architecture is really pleasing to me. So I think in the modern world we have to make these difficult choices over and over again. And I feel slightly guilty now. soft spot for the Native American history in California and the West, especially because everything's been renamed on top of their villages by by white settlers and given white, um, oftentimes military leader names and stuff. So that's kind of fascinating. Yeah, they should have they should have said something about it, and you know, at least then you could have the public to kind of you know make a decision on how to vote on it. They should build on you know for the cemetery. Feel kind of creepy now. <laughs> We're out here visiting, so we're just out having a good time, so. Wow, that's horrible. I had no idea. I'm new to the area, so this is only, like, my second time to the shopping center. I've only, like, just discovered this. The only reason I come here is Rubio's, so I'm sure I can find another Rubio's <laughs> and another movie theater, but that's about it. I think that's very not cool that they built on top of a burial ground, especially when they were protests. That's awful. And, yeah, now that I know, I won't come. Well, I heard that they did, like, a ceremony for it a while back. I assume with the proper ceremony, it would be all right. But it is relatively ironic that th this is built upon what was once, like, sacred land. Many of the dead were buried here. And this was a place for them to be respected. And uh, now... There's a whole bunch of greed in the area that's kind of overpowering that element of, you know, respecting those who have uh, passed on. It, there should be constant recognition and something more than just a few uh, plaques over here out of the way that very few people even see unless they're going for a little walk or something. Listening to Full Circle on KPFA 94.1 FM. Special thanks to Carmen for that Vox Pop. Now, a music break. is the story of how Emeryville has transformed a center of prehistoric cultures to a mecca of corporate profit. It examines the decisions made during the toxic cleanup, excavation, and construction through the eyes of the city of Emeryville, the developer, the archaeologist, and the native Californians who worked on the site. We will be talking to the film's director, Andre Cediel, but first, let's listen to an excerpt from the film. eastern foot of the San Francisco Bay Bridge lies the small city of Emeryville, California. It is a crossroads. Travelers from the four directions arrive at its doorstep at the intersection known as the Maze. Emeryville has capitalized on its location. This location is a fabulous retail site. Uh, it has great uh, freeway visibility. Some 250,000 cars a day travel by on the I-80 freeway, and they travel at usually quite slow speeds, so they have quite a bit of time to see what's going on here. 
Bay Street was born in 2002. 400,000 square feet of retail, restaurants, and a 16-screen movie theater. Apartments and townhouses are coming soon. Even before construction began, both the city and a developer knew they were sitting on a gold mine. What they didn't realize is there would be a hidden cost waiting for them underground. But first, they had to deal with the toxic residue that covered the site. Uh, as a matter of fact, I can show you a photo of that. Um, if you look at the photo, an overhead photo of the city of Emeryville, you will find an orange blob right in the middle of Emeryville. And it stems from the pigment plant that had 100,000 gallon vats of acid making an orange pigment for paint. Um, the ground was bubbling with acid, it, and it had white streaks through it from where the arsenic was. And you could see out in the bay every time it rained that this pollution was flowing quite readily into the bay. It was a fairly horrendous situation, and no one who was a developer would want to be to build alongside that. So it was definitely a stigmata there that um, created a, an issue that needed to be addressed. It wasn't uncommon to have contamination properties, but to have this, these types of chemicals, not only the number of them, but I think uh, the types is I, I, I'm not an environmental engineer, but I understand the, the composition of the area where you have a combination of lead with arsenic. So there was a combinations of chemicals that we hadn't seen in other properties in Emeryville. Inspectors found over 50 different chemicals on site in mixtures they called cocktails. And I don't remember the exact uh, timing, and uh, uh, but I remember it had to do with some um, ponding and shells were then seen. That was, I think, the kind of first indicator that uh, there was, uh, you know, some remnants of the past. When, when Emeryville first contacted me, they were so cryptic, just saying they had an archaeological problem. I didn't know what to expect. But as we were just walking across the site, really just trying to get a sense of the lay of the land, and also um, there were areas of the site that the project engineer had told us we could not go on under any circumstances. So we were just sort of walking around trying to delineate those parts of the site that we could walk on, those parts of the site that we couldn't. And one of my people said, look at this. And we looked down, and there was a burial. And then there was another one five feet away, and another, and another. And, and what, what we saw originally was part of the skull was exposed. So as we started brush, just brushing the dirt off, the whole skeleton became visible. I got this overwhelming comp uh, compulsion, even though I knew that the ground was toxic and that anything you touched there could contaminate you. I couldn't help but bend over and pick up... Um, some bone frags that had it was a jaw actually what it was i picked it up and i kind of dug a little hole and i put them down and i covered it up and i said forgive me there was a lot of human bone just strewn all over the site so it was a matter of um you know scraping along with a, a back hoe, um and just picking up the bits the scattered bits of human bone and he put the backhoe bucket in and immediately exposed several, I mean, several skeletons. They were buried so closely together, one on top of the other and next to each other and everything. But they were so saturated with this stuff. Um, none of us wanted to go in and touch it, even, you know, with gloves on. Well, there were lots of different kinds of ooze. Um, there was a particular kind of ooze that was, um, uh, it made the bones rubbery, um, so that this was probably the worst that I saw. It made the bones a rubbery texture, and when you would pick up uh, the bone, uh, the sort of orange and black oozy goo would kind of run out of it. There was one burial in the site that was, that, that really made us ponder that was two adults buried together side by side and, and intermingled. Their limbs were intermingled. We found 
um, burials of adult women with fetuses or with infants. We found some, found some clusters of burials that almost certainly were buried together or very, very close to the same time. It makes you wonder about the story. The first people to live along the shore of the San Francisco Bay moved in over 5,000 years ago. They found a marshland dense with salmon, otters, seals, and whales. The sea and the sky were filled with millions of migratory birds. The lush environment, good food and weather attracted people from all over. It became one of the most densely populated areas of native North America. The mix of cultures and languages created a diversity unparalleled on the planet. Though they were skilled at hunting deer, elk, and grizzly bears, they survived on a steady diet of shellfish. Large mounds of shells were created from the discarded remnants of their meals, piling up over the centuries. This chunk of the Emeryville shell mound represents 3,000 years of breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Shell by shell, the mound grew three stories high and would have covered an entire city block. It was a huge site, and it was, it was literally like a, a library in an archaeological sense. It was a repository of the knowledge left by generation after generation of prehistoric peoples living in the Bay Area. This is a cemetery, okay, just like any other cemetery. I feel very uncomfortable when I get near it, even though I, I don't think I did a bad thing being out there. I served as a witness. I, I can't imagine wanting to spend too much time okay. there. I can just keep remembering the smells and the sights, and it's, it's, not a, it's not a place to live. It's a burial ground, a contaminated one. And now we have on the line the director of this uh, very interesting documentary piece, uh, Shell Mound, Andre Seriel. Hi, good evening. How are you? Hi, Andres. Thank you so much for being with us on Full Circle. Well, thanks for having me. Um, you know, I went to um, Cal Berkeley uh, back in the early 90s, and Emeryville was just sort of, you know, this wasteland for the most part. And uh, when I returned a few years ago, it was something altogether different. Uh, and it was really interesting to me to learn about the history. So I wonder if you could tell me a little bit about how you came um, to make this film. Well, I also stayed at Berkeley. I was at the journalism school. And as an undergrad, I had done anthropology. And I was interested in ancient cultures and cultures from different parts of the world. And when I was looking for a thesis project, I decided to look for something that was closer to home. And this was right when Bay Street was um, opening up. And there was an article in the San Francisco Chronicle that detailed uh, the 3,000-year history of the site. And I was just astounded. I had never heard this before. I grew up in the Bay Area, went to Cal, studied anthropology, and I had no idea that there was this burial ground in Emeryville. So I started asking everybody I knew, have you heard of this? Have you heard of this? And nobody had heard this story. And so the more I looked into it, the more I found out and realized that this was the story that needed to be told. Yeah, it, it's fascinating. So... um I know there's there's a back in 1990 there was a piece of legislation passed called the Native American Grave uh, Protection and Repatriation Act, and I wonder that that maybe you could talk a little bit about that um, piece of legislation and um, seemingly sort of why there was no protection for uh, these uh, grave and burials uh, at this site. That piece of legislation that's known as NAGPRA um, protects. Uh, graves for federal, federally recognized tribes, that is, tribes that the federal government rep- recognizes as sovereign nations. The Ohlone were a tribe that was recognized by the federal government up until about 1925, I believe, 24, 25, mm-hmm. about the same time that the Shell Mound was destroyed. And then the Ohlone people were no longer recognized. And since they're not a sovereign nation, they do not have those rights under that piece of legislation. So they don't exist as a tribe. Um, they're not a sovereign nation. They don't have these rights. 
and therefore becomes very difficult uh, to organize, to protest uh, these types of developments. So it's, uh, it's, a, it's an interesting accident of history that they were dropped one year uh, with no explanation. Um, but it's left, a, especially in this area of the Bay Area where, as mentioned in the film, was one of the most densely populated areas uh, in all of North America. And here within the Bay Area, we don't have any tribes that are recognized um, by the federal government. Uh, the tribes that do, uh, that are recognized, that uh, have casinos, do, are not from the East Bay. They're not from the peninsula. They're not from San Francisco. Um, so in this area, in the most uh, high-value real estate area, there are no sovereign nations. Wow, I didn't realize that, and I didn't realize that the um, that the those uh, groups that did have casinos and the like were actually not um, local tribes. Well, they're they're from they'll they'll be a little further north up uh, from Napa uh, or or, or out, up towards the Delta, so not too far away. Uh -huh. But if you're fr if you're an Ohlone person and the Ohlone people I've talked to, um, who many of who were some of the first to be displaced by the mission system, and a lot of them ended up in Mission Dolores. Uh, those who fled Mission Dolores because it was a horrible place to be fled to the East Bay Hills uh, where the Spanish would come and round them up and were taken to Mission San Jose in Fremont. And that was one of the, the biggest locales for the Ohlone people um, and where most of their culture uh, was centralized. But those people who would have been originally from the East Bay um, haven't been here in quite some time. And so, um, are you are you familiar with why it is that um, you said it was sort of an accident of history that the Ohlone were dropped in uh, off the uh, Federal Register in the in the mid twenties? Well, the the story, as I understand it, um, during that time there were uh, there were still many groups of Indians that were without land. Uh, destitute, um, who were homeless, so to speak, um, in different parts of California, um, and the and the government decided that they needed to do something about this. So what they did was, in, in terms of trying to bring some of the resources to these most needy groups, they went around and they saw groups like the Ohlone, who were very well established um, in the South Bay who didn't seem to need any help. Uh, they had ranches. They, a lot of them survived on a piece of land uh, owned by the Hearst family, and they didn't need any assistance. And they said, uh, well, you guys don't need our help. And Ohlone said, well, no, we don't need your help. And that's kind of how they just ended up not on the list the next year, which is uh, it's, it's completely illegal. Uh, the only way that you can be dropped from the registry is through an act of Congress, and that didn't happen. Uh, so it was. Uh, there was. There was. Uh, there were many other tribes that were dropped during this this sweep in the mid twenties, and I'm not sure that there's anybody who's. I'd like to know if there's somebody who's gone around looking for reasons. I know that uh, a lot of the only Ohlone people are still trying to uh, regain their status as a sovereign nation, but up till now they haven't had any luck. Yeah, that was my, that was actually my next question. So they are. So there is an effort to try to re regain yeah, their sovereignty. Uh huh. And I assume it's been going on for a while, just as as there was an effort to try to stop um, this building uh, desecration of of this grave site. And there was an effort, um, and that was that was um, that was quashed pretty early on. There was uh, a very coordinated effort by the city of Emeryville and the developers not to let people know what was happening. Um, so, for instance, the first archaeologists who came onto, came onto the site because they literally had just all of a sudden found all these bones. And he walked onto the site and he started looking around and he saw these bones and he said, you guys have this, you have an issue here. You know, this is, we need a major excavation. This is going to cost you a million dollars to figure out. They said, thank you very much. You're fired. And by the way, um, don't tell anybody about this or we're going to sue you. Um, he was basically gave a, was put on the gag order, as were the following um, archaeological firms that came in and did the rest of the work. So all the time that the archaeology was happening, none of this was getting out into the public. People didn't realize 
the extent um, of the 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 graves, the bodies, the hundreds of remains that were being found, none of that was being made public. Um, and in fact, today some of the final reports from the archaeologists haven't even been uh, completed because the funding has been taken away from them. So they're sitting on all these reams of data of all the bones that they found, but they don't have the funding to, to publish their final report. Do the archaeologists have an estimate of the um, approximate number of um, graves that were at the site? The archaeologists found, and there were three different firms who worked on it, approximately 300 uh, burials, 300 individuals. And these 300 individuals were reburied at Bay Street in an unmarked location. And one of the things that I asked everybody I spoke to because there was a big... Uh, the, the developer was very vocal in saying that they had uh, developed this site in a very careful manner to disturb as few graves as possible. Um, um, so I, the, the next question I asked were, were there bones that you didn't find? And all the archaeologists agreed that, well, surely there were many, many more bones. Well, can you give me a number? Um, and as scientists, they didn't want to guess, but their best guesstimate was that there was hundreds, of, hundreds more burials that they hadn't found. So whenever I talk to people about going to Bay Street and whether they feel comfortable going there or not, I tell them, you know, all you have to do is think, is be aware that you're walking into a cemetery. There's at least 300 burials that we know of that everybody agrees upon that were dug up and reburied. And the experts who were there estimate that there were hundreds more that they didn't find. So a, a, a rough estimate is that there's about 500 people buried there. And it's a cemetery. Um, so in terms of how you feel about visiting a cemetery, what your mindset is when you go there, uh, just keep that in mind. Mm-hmm. Yes, and, um, you know, when I first got here and saw that Emeryville had turned from sort of industry to uh this interesting uh, place of corporate capitalism, I thought, hmm, there's, there's a store or two I wouldn't mind going to. But once I found out about this history, I don't want to set foot on the land. So um, it's 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 just been a very, very interesting story. So can you tell us where um, we can see the film? Is it available? Are you still screening it at all? Do we just go through your website? What's the best way to get a hold of the film? At this point, the easiest way, uh, you can find out more about the film on my website, which is shellmoundthemovie.com. And right now it's being uh, distributed through New Day Films, which is my educational distributor. Or through my website, you can just send me an email, um, and that's the easiest way to get in contact with me. Uh, I do screenings uh, by request. So um, if people want to see the film and they want to organize a, a venue, we can get some people together and watch the film. Uh, it be my pleasure to do that. One of the things I've always wanted to do is show the film at Bay Street. Um, there's a lot of people who live there now. Right. Uh, they have apartments. They have DVD players. It would be great to organize a screening at Bay Street itself. All right. Well, thank you so much. Um, we've been speaking with Andre Sediel, director of the film Shell Mound. And again, you can um, check out his website at uh, shellmoundthemovie.com. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Take care. Take care. And you're listening to Full Circle on KPFA 94.1 FM. Moi, moi, Canyon Sawyer's Roots singing a beautiful Ohlone Shumash song in honor of the grandmothers.
Next, we talk to Ariel Lucky, a hip-hop theater artist that has also taken up the issue of the Emeryville Shell Mound in his new work, Freeland, which he will be performing at the Berkeley Rep next month. Before we speak with Lucky, let's listen to an excerpt from his Shell Mound piece. lived on this land? What happened to them? For thousands of years, the Ohlone have lived here, where the complex ecology of land and water brings an abundance of food. Shellfish, a central staple for the Ohlone. Mussels, clams, oysters, crabs, gooseneck barnacles, abalone, gathered in wicker baskets, cleaned and cooked and eaten. Shells discarded on the ground accumulate over time into mounds. Hundreds of years of shells. Layers of life and death. The Ohlone buried their dead here. Bodies covered in red ochre. Buried with precious possessions. Abalone ornaments. Elk bone whistles. Bundles of raptor talons. Buried in fetal position next to their families shell mound cemeteries <laughs> sacred sites this shell mound was the biggest around the bay over 65 feet tall 350 feet diameter bigger than a city block built by generations of shells bones and bodies earth and rock and plants packed together like puzzle pieces while the people collect acorns in the autumn, hunt deer in the spring, weave baskets of willow and fern root, sweat ceremonies and timiscals, and sing to the spirits of the trees. A civilization too subtle for European eyes. I walk four blocks from my house to the border of Emeryville. Through the brand new gentrification condominiums, <laughs> past the train tracks, over to the Bay Street Mall. At the intersection of Shell Mound Street and Ohlone Way, I stop and look around. 360 degrees of development, all built in the last 10 years. It all has that new plasticky kind of feel, like it's a Disneyland set or something. 250,000 cars drive by this spot on I-80 every single day. <laughs> I've driven through here thousands of times. But I've never stopped to really look, to really see the land below the city. What's down there? Like archaeologists read rocks to tell time in reverse, this land holds history carved in its flesh. Stories submerged in its structure. Starting at the surface and digging down into the unknown history of my homeland. Digging down, digging down, the digging down. 2007, I stand on this land, this shopping mall owned and operated by Madison Marquette. Easy to forget where I am in the glittering glass of American gluttony. Shiny and new and on sale, 400,000 square feet of retail. Banana Republic, Bank of America, Barnes & Noble, Victoria Secret, Old Navy, H&M, and The Gap. 264 apartments, 82 townhouses, 16 movie screens, 230 hotel rooms, 2,000 parking spaces. Adjacent Ikea. Thick slab of pavement over earth packed hard and heavy, dead in the screaming silence of the past, digging down. 1999, down beneath sidewalk and street. Mall construction disturbs buried bodies. Ohlone ancestors sleep for thousands of years, wake up to the sound of blaring bulldozers scraping their souls into steel boxes. Some bones so toxic they feel like rubber. So drunk off chemical cocktails, they're handled and disposed of as toxic waste. Others buried in unmarked mass graves, hundreds removed from their resting place to create space for the foundation of the new mall. Emeryville City Council calls desecrated cemetery progress. And stonewalls local and Ohlone community members who demand respect for the dead. Corporate officials play their game to win. Offer losers a fake 50-foot shell mound filled with whitewashed history. 
adding insult to injury. Saying nothing about Ohlone burials, nothing about the thousands of bodies already removed, nor the hundreds that remain, nothing about the vibrant Ohlone community alive today. Digging down. 1981. Amidst rusty industry and economic decline, this land's assigned federal designation is a brownfield. Soil fully saturated with hydrogen sulfide arsenic lead DDT residuals and petroleum hydrocarbons. The ground bubbles with acid as volatile heavy metals seep into buried bones, bleed into Timiskau Creek, run red into the bay. Muddy water poisoned before I was born. Digging down. 1924. This land is sold to Sherman Williams Paint Company. Their Cover the Earth logo depicts a paint bucket pouring blood red paint over blue green globe, suffocating the planet as businessmen drive steam shovels, clawing and ripping the largest shell mound down to ground level. Archaeologist notes 692 bodies found and haphazardly destroyed. Arrowheads, knives, spearheads, mortars, pestle, ceremonial pipes, all devoured by hungry metal mouths crunching through hundreds of years of history. Shell mound material calcium rich from shells and bones used to pave Oakland Berkeley streets. College Avenue, Dwight Way, I-80. White people paved their modern roads with bones of Ohlone ancestors. Paving the roads with bones. Walking on a people's history without regard. Digging down, 1876. The year Custer was killed and blood rained down on the dull knife battlefield. An entrepreneur establishes an amusement park. Shell Mound Park. With horse track, carousel, train station, bowling alley, shooting range, restaurants, bars, and a dance pavilion placed directly on top of the Shell Mound. Wealthy white people flock from big city across the bay to dance polkas, Irish jigs, and fast waltzes on the graves of Ohlone men, women, and children. Literally dancing on Ohlone graves, drunk and dancing on their graves until prohibition slows the stream of amusement seekers to a lonely trickle. A lonely land littered with broken beer bottles and empty bullet shells. Digging down, 1850. The story expands. Shell Mound land part of territory colonized into California. Golden State feeding, gold rush seething with 300,000. 49ers fiending gold, rushing to mine rivers, bleeding gold. Immigrant greed speeds native genocide. Disease and murder explode like gunpowder as state leaders pay white militias $1 million to hunt for native scalps. $5 a head. Over 4,000 native children kidnapped and sold into legalized slavery. While the San Francisco economy swells exponentially and the shell mounds scream in silence. Digging down, the land passes hands from U.S. to Mexico, from Mexico to Spain. Digging down, 1769, Father Junipero Serra stabs the earth with Spanish flagpole. European invaders establish mission system slavery for lonely manual labor. Kidnap and convert Ohlone children to save their souls from a Christian devil. Ohlone backs broken by guns and Bibles. Survival wrong like water from stone. A people's home gutted and burned, beaten bloody and bruised bodies. Women raped by Spanish soldiers. Diseases surge in waves of widespread death. And that was a very powerful piece uh, by Ariel Lucky, who joins us on the line to talk about that piece, that Shell Mound piece. Hi, Ariel. Hey, what's happening? How are you? I'm doing real good. Thanks for having me on. Thank you for being with us. No problem. So um, I'd like to sort of start by talking a little bit about your motivation for this piece. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it actually all started when I was looking into my family history, and I found out that the ranch that my grandfather grew up on in Wyoming was a homestead. It was free land given to my family from the government. 
And I had never known that before. I was a young adult at the time, and it raised a lot of questions for me, you know, particularly who had lived on that land in Wyoming before my family got it for free. And so I started looking into it, and I found out that there was a major battle on that land in Wyoming between the U.S. Army and the Northern Cheyenne in 1876 and started realizing, making these connections, that, you know, the only way that my family was able to get free land was that it, it had been stolen from the Native American folks who had lived there for thousands of years. And so I did a lot of research and actually traveled to Wyoming and looked into that history and did a lot of work around that. And then I came back to Oakland, which is where I've lived my entire life, and, uh, you know, raised, it raised the same questions when I got back here of like, well, who are the indigenous people of this land and what happened to them? And, you know, what's my relationship now in, you know, 2010? So I started looking into the history of this area and the Shell Mound in Emeryville and particularly the, the Bay Street Mall and that whole story really kind of uh, came to a central focus for the show. So had you been familiar with the, the, the uh, Bay Street uh, history before you began looking into the history of your own um, family's land? No, not at all. And, you know, again, I grew up here. I went to school here, um, both public and private schools. I went to college. And never in that time did I really learn anything about the Ohlone, about their history, their culture, about the colonization and genocide that happened here. Um, pretty consistently across the country, that kind of information is not included um, in, you know, in students' education. So it wasn't until I'm early 20s doing the research on my own that I actually started to really learn the history of the land that I had lived on all my life. Mm, I see. Fascinating. I mean, it's really interesting. I, I sort of spent time here in college before I came back, and um, there wasn't the Bay Street Mall when I left, and when I came back, it was there, but I had no idea about the history, and so it's just been really interesting personally just to sort of learn about it. Um, you, you, I understand that you worked with um, Youth at Destiny Arts on a, a, a Shell Mound piece uh, as well. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, Destiny Arts Center, for folks who don't know, is one of the most amazing youth arts violence prevention programs in the country, and they're based right here in Oakland. And um, they have a high school performance company that does incredible work every year. They create and write their own original show. It's dance and theater and martial arts and aerial dance, all kinds of, of stuff. And um, I did a residency with them. Let's see, the spring of 2009, and uh, during that time, I performed uh, the part of Freeland, uh, my show, that deals with the Shell Mound, did some workshops around it. Um, we brought in Karina Gould, who is an Ohlone community member here and activist. She organizes the Shell Mound walks every fall um, that trace from Shell Mound to Shell Mound around the bay. Um, so the students got exposed to all this information and um, got inspired to integrate that into their um, original play that they produced uh, March of 2009. And so you deal a lot with the issue of sort of white privilege in your work. Why is that work so important to you? Well, for me personally, as a white person, um, you know, it's an, it's a very significant part of my own identity and my and has shaped my life and experiences and you know it really raises this question of like uh you know unearned benefits right like how has my life been shaped by the fact that i'm white by the fact that um there's institutional benefits for white folks in this country you know for example the the land that my family was given the homestead act was passed in 1862 and it was basically a mechanism to take the land that had just been stolen from Native Americans and transfer it to individual white families. And that was a federal policy, and my family benefited from that. There's all kinds of ways like that that me and my family and most white folks in general have benefited from those kind of unearned privileges. And so, you know, it's just an important part for me of, like, being con concerned with community social justice issues, wanting to um, be a good person in the world and do my part to kind of heal the trauma and, and legacies of, of these cycles of violence in this country. And as an artist, I've integrated that into into the creative work that I produce. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's great. And it's it's, it's really powerful work. Um, so you have a show coming up next month at the Berkeley Rep. Can you tell us sort of we've been sort of concentrating specifically on Shell Mound, but I think Freeland is a larger work. You want to talk a little 
little bit more in general about uh, the uh, piece that you've got coming up at the Berkeley Rep next month? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, October 8th, Friday, October 8th, um, I'm going to be performing uh, my one-man show called Freeland, which is uh, a hip-hop theater piece at the Berkeley Rep Theater, the Rhoda uh, stage in downtown Berkeley. And um, it's a 90-minute piece that integrates spoken word poetry, dance, hip-hop music, and, and, and acting to tell the story, um, featuring uh, DJ Saquon uh, on the turntables. He's um, I, the DJ is like mixing the soundtrack in live, and um, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna do a one night at the Berkeley Rep. I invite folks to come out and uh, check it out. If you want more information, you can go to speakoutnow.org. It's speakoutnow.org. It's all one word. Or you can check out my website at freelandproject.com. Again, just freelandproject, all one word at uh, dot com. And uh, it's going to be really a lovely evening of um, of, of hip hop theater. And the Shell Mound piece is a is a really substantial t- section of my show. And so we'll be going into that history in a lot more depth. Okay, so uh, we've been speaking with Ariel Lucky, hip hop theater artist, about his work on the Shell Mound. Be sure and check him out at ariellucky dot com and. Be sure and check out his show, Freeland, next month. Uh, that's Friday, October 8th at the Berkeley Rep. So, Ariel, thanks so much for joining us. This is a really powerful work, and I hope folks um, really come out and really learn this history because, um, unfortunately, too many of us um, are unaware. So thanks for joining us. Absolutely. Thank you. Have a great night. All right. You too. Take care. Peace. And up next... We move away from corporate consumerism to do-it-yourself alternatives. So, you know, love what you do and make money at it. This is Jane Chang of Telemana, and I spoke with a few small business owners who do just that, with the opportunity of early exposure to the arts as kids, to the love of family and friends. Do-it-yourself entrepreneurs can also look to websites like Etsy.com for additional support. Samantha of Notify.com, which is N-O-T-E-F-Y-I.com, and uh, Maria of Lemonade Handmade, and Simply Selma tell her story. My name is Samantha Barsky, and I run Notify, but it's spelled N-O-T-E-I-F-Y, and it's a note card, gift tag, paper product business. I think when I got sort of more into photography is when I really decided that I liked to do a lot of cool stuff with photos because I'm not a traditional artist per se. So painting and illustrating and drawing are not my forte. So when I was in high school and I had a camera, and this is still back in the day of, of film. My line is all recycled paper and envelopes. That's a big thing for me aesthetically and also environmentally. I use a lot of craft paper, so the brown craft paper. I like the way it looks, and also I think it evokes a response with people. They understand, you know, okay, so it's recycled craft paper, like we get it. And I think, too, with I do a lot of farm animal and barn imagery, and so it looks kind of country chic or farm chic, I like to say. So, you know, and then I usually use, like, an envelope with a really good pop of color. Mainly for people being able to find me. I've been approached by a couple of stores outside of the Bay Area that are now carrying my stuff because they found me on Etsy. And so that's been really nice. And also... Etsy offers a lot of community and they offer a lot of advice and some really good um, blogs and such. So, you know, it's, it's a good community to be a part of. And apparently my dove likes, likes Etsy as well. I'm Maria Germans Guard, and my business is Lemonade Handmade Jewelry. 
So I'm part of the SF Etsy team, which is a group of Etsy sellers who all live in the SF Bay Area. And we work together to make sure, to kind of increase our own awareness of different events in the area, of kind of opportunities that may be coming down the pike, of classes, of marketing possibilities. And that's a really great way to kind of get your name out there. It's entirely an entirely different experience. So I think the greatest things about Etsy, there are a lot of great things about Etsy. I think one of them is that people from all over the world are selling. And so you're you're talking to people from across the globe in the forums. You're looking at people's work from across the globe. Um, you're just exposed to things that you wouldn't see and in a really easy way. So I, I mean, I, mean, I make jewelry, but I've seen really amazing sculpture on Etsy or ceramics and I might not otherwise have seen that and I really like the support that you get on Etsy you can throw a question out there in the forums or you know in our Google group for S of Etsy team and get replies almost instantaneously there are people out there who are just in the same position as you small business people independent business people and people are I'd say on the whole really looking out for one another and want to help other independent craftspeople succeed I think that's great My name is Salma Muzaffar. I've been doing henna body art for about 14 years now. Yeah. And it's like a temporary tattoo that goes on the skin and stays about two weeks. And what kind of inks do you use? Um, henna is an all-natural dye. It actually comes from the henna plant. So it's just the leaf of the plant ground up. And then I mix it together with a little bit of lemon juice, sugar, and eucalyptus oil. And how did you get into it? Well, I was born and raised in Pakistan, and over there, just like in India, we do henna traditionally for weddings and different religious holidays. So I grew up seeing it done a lot, and when I moved out here about 16 years ago, I saw people doing it, and I thought that was really cool, you know, that all the way out here, I mean, they don't do it for the same reason, it's more like just a temporary tattoo, but yeah, I thought I'd, uh, you know, pick it up, so I got some henna and started practicing and did it for free for a little while, and... Here I am, 14 years later, still doing it. <laughs> did you have family that did it too? Um, not professionally, but you know, people put henna in their hair as well, and you can get little pre-mixed cones which you can draw on people. So, my aunts, you know, we used to get together and put it in our hair together, and maybe get a couple cones and draw on each other. But yeah, nothing professional. So I get my henna sent to me from my father back in Pakistan. So it comes in just like a powder form of like the crushed up leaves. And I boil some tea water uh, and I strain it and I put it in there and then some lemon juice, sugar and a couple drops of eucalyptus oil. So it's just kind of like a, the consistency of like a, like a toothpaste or something. And then you draw it on the skin and then you leave it on um, for the rest of the day, hopefully. And then when you wash it off, it leaves like a, a brown stain that stays for about two to three weeks on average. So all of the inks are completely natural. There's no chemicals. Some people add um, different kinds of dyes and stuff to make their henna stay black, but you could get really bad reactions from stuff like that. Yeah. Hi there. And it just comes out like kind of like a little squeeze bottle. You just like, you know, draw it on like that. You can get pretty fine lines. And then... Um, the longer you leave it on, the darker it gets. So, like you can see after wiping it off, there's like a, a faint line, but not that much, you know. And that's pretty much it. I mean, it's easy to use. It's fun to do. And people really enjoy it, you know. It's all natural. It doesn't hurt. And it doesn't stay forever. Pakistan's got some very good henna, high henna quality. Just like India, Morocco's got good henna. Egypt's got good henna. Um, I like this type that they have over there, though, because it's very fresh. If you buy the henna that's been sitting around in the stores, in, like in the Indian stores here, um, you don't know how long it's been sitting there for. You ideally want to get uh, henna powder that has been harvested within the past maybe one to two years. So it's, you know, if you get it sent right from where it's being made, you know that it's fresh. Same, same with the regular tea. You don't want old tea. Exactly. Exactly. Guys interested? Oh, yeah. If you have, the average price is between 10 and 20.
You can visit Samantha's website at notify, that's N-O-T-E-I-F-Y dot com. Maria uh, can be found at Etsy, the Etsy site, and type in Lemonade Handmade. And on September 12th, she's going to be at Solano Stroll from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. on Solano, Solano Avenue in Berkeley. Simply, uh, Simply Salma is also on the Etsy site. You can visit her. Also, you can visit her table on Telegraph and Durant Avenue in Berkeley. So that's local. You should go and check her out. I want to give a special thanks to Eileen of Modern Mouse in Alameda and Shauna Ray of Telemont. So, for your information, listen up. We are now accepting applications for the KPFA Apprenticeship Program. The applications are due on Friday, September 17th, no later than 5 p.m. To download an application online, visit kpfaapprentice.org, and you can be behind the mic just like I am. You can also check out our Facebook page at First Voice KPFA Apprenticeship. And now an announcement. Um, on Sunday, September 5th, from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m., Instituting Science in Schools Science and Cultural Festival will be hosted by Wapoli, featuring a special holographic presentation by most deaf and NASA astronaut Leland Melvin. ISIS will be at the Chabot Space and Science Center, located at 10,000 Skyline Boulevard in Oakland. The admission is free, so check that out. Also, another uh, announcement we have, don't miss ZEM, San Francisco's uh, Children's Museum, Intergalactic Adventure on Saturday, September 11th, and Sunday, September 12th from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. You'll learn to wield a lightsaber with Jedi Master obi Sean. <laughs> <laughs> Meet your favorite Star Wars, the Clone Wars characters, participate in our Jedi costume parade, and create untold stories of a galaxy far, far away. For more information, visit zm.org or contact 415-820-3320. All right, well, that brings us to the end of tonight's show. Tune in next week to Full Circle at 7 p.m. on KPFA. Our website is kpfaapprentice.org. You can also check out our archive shows at kpfa.org. Special thanks to our production and technical interns from the KPFA Apprenticeship Program, Group 34, Telemana. We are Shana, Sukari, Courtney, Sean Ray, Lindsay, Living Lamont, and me, Jane. Our executive producers are Miss M and Miss Renee. Our technical director is Free Will and Franklin. Our intro music is produced by Source of Labor, and our outro music is produced by B. Tondre. If you have any questions or topics for future shows, give us a call back at 510-848-6767, extension 627, or send an email at fullcircle at kpfa.org. With Shana and uh, Group 35, Sam and Saishi, she's been holding down the controls. We've been your hosts. Jane and Sukari. Thanks for joining us tonight on Full Circle. Stay tuned for La Onda Fajita. Statements belong to the author of the statement only. My name is Faye Sayadi. I am an Iraqi Kurd, a doctor, a journalist, and a peace and human rights activist. I have had two shows in KPFA, Voices of the Middle East and North Africa and Labor Collective. The issues I'm very passionate about are victims of Katrina, women, children, and refugee issues, and displaced people everywhere. 
also preventing honor killings and the death penalty. I am running with Voices for Justice Radio.org. Vote for me and our slave. We will bring the voices of the voiceless to KPFA. My name is Kate Tanaka. I want to find ways to strengthen the station and empower those who provide all of us with the programming we so depend upon to be the informed citizens that are the hope of a decent society. Please vote for me, Kate Tanaka, and other candidates endorsed by the Independents for Community Radio. 